Good morning, everyone. I am so thankful that we can start. We are going to have ourselves a word of prayer, and I need you to get computers, pen and paper out, whatever it is you take notes with, because I'm going to highlight some things here that we're going to be doing. This morning, we're going to spend the first hour or so looking at diseases, specific diseases, and then we're going to break you up into groups, and then what you're going to do in your groups is you're going to have to utilize the things that you have learned pertaining to the laws of health. Remember, this is God's plan of healing. So therefore, we're going to use God's plan of healing to go ahead and see how it can bring about restoration to an individual with these specific diseases. I have highlighted diseases of, uh, of which you're going to run into this. When you talk with people, when you work with people, you are going to run into people with these diseases. So therefore, I'm going to go ahead and let you now put together something where you're going to help someone know how to overcome their disease by the use of the laws of health. Okay? So, let's begin with a word of prayer. We're going to go through some of the issues with disease, and then we will go and take it further. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the blessing that you've given us to help us see another day. We thank you for the beauty of this day, for the wonderful weather, and most importantly for the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, who still continues to shine in our hearts. Lord, we come at this time asking you for forgiveness of our sins, and we're asking for the, pre the presence of your Holy Spirit, that he may come and minister to our minds and open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of your word. Abide with us now, Lord, and continue to teach us, we pray, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to be talking about disease. We're going to take a general look at some of the key diseases that affect us in Western society. We're going to look at what's called WDLDs. That stands for Western Debilitating Lifestyle Diseases. And uh, when you look at these diseases, what you're going to do is you're going to take God's plan. We've learned God's plan. We've seen God's mode of healing, the things that God has endorsed. And as a result of that, we're going to see now how can we use these things that God has endorsed to bring about healing and restoration to the soul. And we're going to apply it to what you're about to see here. The first one we're going to look at is going to be none other than, bear with me, none other than, Let's see if we can get, okay. Well, we're going to look at diabetes. That's going to be the first thing we're going to look at is diabetes. Diabetes, do you agree that that's a disease that is definitely affecting, you know, thousands upon thousands of people? The, the chances of us be, being amongst those who suffer with diabetes is very, very, very high. Now, in doing this, we're going to specifically look at diabetes type 2. We're not going to focus on diabetes type 1. Diabetes type 1 affects a far smaller population in America than type 2. There, there's some wonderful things we can learn about type 1, but that's not our focus for this class, okay? Now, when we look at diabetes, the first thing we want to do is just kind of get an idea as to what is diabetes. And we're going to go ahead and look at this, where I want you to notice that there's a book called Health Power. Um, normally, when we run a school like this, normally I would want Health Power to be one of our textbooks, because it's a really good book to go over disease. Um, if you don't have that in your library, I want to encourage you to add that into your library, the book Health Power. It's a very, very good book. Yes. Health Power is by uh, two doctors. One is called Aline Ludington, and the other one is Hans Deal. Um, very, very good book. It's a very good book. Now, in Health Power, page 52, what it does is it tells you this. Diabetes occurs when the body becomes unable to handle sugar. Okay which builds up to dangerous levels in the blood. So this is why sugar and diabetes are always connected. Because what happens is the body cannot handle the amount of glucose, the amount of sugar that is coming into the system. The body has a way to, to, to normally take in sugar uh, and kind of manage it along with insulin so that it can be properly processed through the body. But what happens is in diabetes, there's somewhere of a disability. There's something happening in the system that causes that sugar to not be properly managed. Therefore, it starts to build up to high and very dangerous levels in the system. A diagnosis of diabetes is usually made when a blood sugar test is consistently above 125. So when a person gets their glucose levels checked, if they're, above, if they're uh, at 125 or above, they are considered diabetics. 
They are full-blown diabetics. If, uh, after, and this is after an eight-hour fast, you do your blood sugar test. Um, fasting blood sugar levels of 100 to a 125 are known as pre-diabetes. So in other words, if a person is 125 and above, that's considered to be diabetes. If the person is between 100 and 125, then they are pre-diabetic. They are disposed to it. They are, they are just about right there. So what do you think is the goal as far as blood sugar level? It should be where? Under 100. Under 100. Excellent. So therefore, you want to get the person under 100. So this is something you want to keep in mind when you are working with individuals who are ill with diabetes. This is a very important thing that you want to help manage them. You will find that diabetes actually is, is a very, very, type 2, is a very simple disease for individuals to actually overcome. Um, it's not terribly difficult, and it just takes some ascertaining of the cause and so on. Now, my father died last year because of the complications connected to diabetes. So though diabetes is, is a tremendous cause of death, it's really the complications that come with it that if they are not dealt with quickly, then it begins to build up in a person that eventually it can debilitate them to the point that it can actually kill them, all right? So when you, if you get diabetes, in, in other words, you want to make sure that you're testing yourselves. I hope you do test yourselves. And what I mean by that is get annual checkups. Get checkups. There's no sin in making sure your body is well. And therefore, you know, a lot of us, I, I, the more that I talk, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, I find that we are not good stewards with our bodies. We are good stewards with God's church. We are good stewards with our money sometimes, but we're horrible stewards when it comes to the body temple. We do not take care of this body as we should. And there's certain things that you don't know. And I don't know. And therefore, it becomes necessary sometimes to go ahead and get the blood taken, get the blood drawn, so you can know what's going on in my system. How can I know for sure that my cholesterol levels and all these other things are where they need to be? And it's a blessing because when I was in Romania uh, last year, when I got my last checkup, you know, it was a blessing to, to go there. And we, because we were working with a medical facility, you know, they did the blood work on me. And, you know, praise the Lord. Everything came in, flying colors. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And I was like, thank the Lord. And it's good because now you have a gauge of where you're at because most individuals who have type 2 diabetes are undiagnosed. In other words, you could be walking with diabetes right now and you wouldn't even know it until something happens. In other words, sometimes you go through dizziness, you go through certain spells, and you're wondering, oh, man, that just happened for no reason, but it actually could have happened because you're actually diabetic and you didn't know that. And therefore, you, some of us, we wait until the large complications kick in, and then obviously we have to now do some more legwork to overcome. Um, okay, so we understand that. Now, when we're dealing with type 2 diabetes, non-insulin dependent diabetes, it's actually called adult onset diabetes or non-insulin diabetes mellitus. It, this type affects over 90% of diabetics, type 2. That's why we're talking about type 2. Type 1... We know type 1 exists, um, but, you know, you'll find that type 2 is, is the one that affects people on a much larger level. Basically, what's happening is the food is going into the stomach, and the stomach has to convert it to glucose. The glucose then enters the bloodstream. And another word for glucose is what? Sugar. Sugar. So the glucose enters the bloodstream. But then the pancreas produces sufficient insulin but it is resistant to effective use. So normally that insulin is supposed to help manage that glucose as it's flowing through the bloodstream. And therefore, if it's managed properly, then it's not an issue because it's able to get into the cell receptors and so on. But in this case, what happens is the, it, the pancreas is supposed to produce the sufficient insulin, but it is resistant to effective use. So it's not working as it should. Therefore, the glucose is unable to enter the body effectively, and then the glucose levels increase to dangerous levels in the system. This is what ultimately brings about this situation of type 2 diabetes. Something is blocking the insulin so it cannot do its job properly. That's the issue with type 2. Something is blocking the insulin that is not allowing it to do its job properly. We've got to find out what that something is. Now, when we find out that something, here's the thing. The University of Kentucky, this, is, this article is in the book Health Power. It's a very powerful article. 
The, univers the University of Kentucky did a test because when you think about type 2 diabetes, what do we typically think about as the issue? Well, typically sugar. Gen generally, generally it's, it's a sugar management issue. That is typically how the medical world addresses the issue with diabetes. Now, the University of Kentucky, what they did was they took several lean, healthy young men. And what they did was they brought them in and tested them where they fed them a very high-fat diet, over 65%. Over 65% fat diet. Fed them very little sugar. In two weeks, every single one of them became diabetics. In two weeks? Two weeks. Every single one of them. Now, they took another group, lean, healthy young men, fed them a low-fat diet, and literally fed them one pound of sugar per day for 11 weeks. I want you to think about that. They fed them. This was a test. They fed them one pound of sugar per day for 11 weeks. Not one diabetic produced. Not one diabetic. This was a, this was a test done at the University of Kentucky. So they found that there's a great emphasis on sugar, but there wasn't enough of an emphasis on fat. So therefore, they started to look at how fat was really the culprit and not so much the sugar. Now, we know that too much sugar in the system ultimately can produce fat, all right? So sugar is tied into it, but they started, the doctors began to see, we have to start zooming in more on the fat intake of individuals in their diet and not so much the sugar intake because people consume a far, a far greater amount of fat in their diets, the standard American diet, SAD diet, people consume far more greater amounts of fat than they do sugar. So therefore, what we have found as far as, you know, warning signs, these are the warning signs of diabetes. Your frequent urination. If a person is just frequently urinating all the time, even though they're not even drinking a lot of water, but they're frequently urinating, that is a sign of diabetes. Again, it doesn't have to be diabetes, but it is a sign of type 2 diabetes. In addition to that, another sign is weight loss. All of a sudden, your weight just starts dropping off, but you're not even hardly exercising. But you're finding sometimes that you're going through some type of dramatic weight loss. That's also a sign of diabetes. It's a sign. But may I ask you a question? What if you're not eating sugar? How come you could uh, you didn't do all of that? Fat. Remember, we saw that fat is one of the key reasons why individuals develop type 2 diabetes. It's their fat intake. So it, even though they may be low on sugar, because remember, the University of Kentucky, when they did their test, they fed them low sugar but high fat. It, every single one of them became diabetics. So it was a fat issue. Excessive thirst. Excessive thirst is another sign. And then lack of energy. You're always low on energy. Just always low, low, low on energy. When we find these type of signs taking place, these are signs that lets us know that you may be diabetic. Okay, so if any about anyone in this room or anyone you know of says, you know, I constantly find myself urinating or I'm seeing sometimes my weight is just dropping or I'm consistently thirsty no matter how much I'm drinking or you know what, I'm always low on energy. If you find that you have these type of symptoms and because a great number of diabetics are not diagnosed, you would do well to get yourself tested on your glucose levels. Check your sugar levels. It might be that you are diabetic and the sooner you find out, the better it is to deal with it, okay? So, looking at that, these are some of the signs, and what is found basically are two key contributors to diabetes is, watch this, two of the key contributors of diabetes, well, sometimes it can occur as a result of what we call, you know, inherited, inherited disease or acquired. I like to put it this way. When a person says it's hereditary, you know, this disease in my family is hereditary. Just remember that hereditary, heredity is like a gun, but lifestyle is what pulls the trigger. So her, a, gun, a gun is not dangerous as long as it sits on a table. But a gun is dangerous when somebody picks it up and then makes that little joint movement like that. You get it? So therefore, heredity is like a gun, but lifestyle is what pulls that trigger. So heredity, yeah, that, that's a factor in diabetes, but as long as the lifestyle is, is managed properly, all is well. I have diabetes that runs rampant through my father's side. I am supposed to be diabetic. 
I have cancer that runs rampant through my mother's side. I am definitely of a, a high potential of cancer. But it's the lifestyle that determines whether you get these diseases and not necessarily. Yeah, so it is. So we can have the predisposition, but at the end of the day, it's your lifestyle that's going to really determine if this thing becomes a reality to you or not. Heredity plays a very, very small role when it comes to diseases passing from generation to generation. The problem is most of us do what our parents did. So we get what our parents had. But if the lifestyle changes, my lifestyle is drastically different from how my mother and my father live. And that's, by, I believe, by the grace of God, why I stand before you 40 years old, completely cancer-free, completely high blood pressure-free, completely diabetes-free. It's the lifestyle. God gives a new lifestyle. Okay? Now, so therefore, the real issues is really fat and fat. Animal fat and fat on the body. And you will find that if you and I can manage the fat and the fat as it relates to the human anatomy and our systems, we will find that we can put a pretty good check on diabetes. Okay? So the key issue with diabetes is dealing with fat in the system that debilitates those insulins to, the insulin to get into the cell receptors to manage that glucose level. You follow that? Fat and fat. Fat on the body, fat in the diet. Fat on the body, fat in the diet. All right? Okay. Now let's move on to hypertension. Hypertension. Yes. Yes. And then the other one is ex excessive hunger as well. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for that. Those are also factors as well. Now we're up to hypertension. When we deal with hypertension, let's take a look at some things here. Hypertension, another way of saying high blood pressure. What is blood pressure? Did you know that our heart pumps approximately 1,900 gallons of blood through the blood vessels in your body every day? 1,900 gallons of blood. It's a lot of blood. Blood pressure is the force applied against the walls of the arteries as the heart pumps blood through the body. The pressure is determined by the force and amount of blood pumped and the size and flexibility of the arteries. So depending on the size of your arteries and the flexibility of your arteries will determine how much pressure has to be used to get blood to go through the vessels. You follow that? Depending on the size of the arteries and the flexibility of the arteries. How many of you have ever heard of a boa constrictor? How does it kill its prey? It squeezes them to death, so it can't breathe, right? So that's called constriction, right? That's why it's called a boa constrictor. It constricts, it squeezes, so that the, the prey cannot breathe. Therefore, we have something called blood vessels. When you go through blood pressure, the vessels should be open enough so that, and flexible enough so that the heart can just pump smoothly and get the blood through without having to put undue pressure. How many of you wear glasses? Now, when you had to get your glasses, what did they have to do to your eyes? Dilation. They had to dilate them. What does it mean to dilate? Enlarge. Enlarge or to keep it open, right? So therefore, there's vasoconstriction, vessels being constricted, and then there's vasodilation, where the vessels can be open, right? What we want is vasodilation. We don't want vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is what's going to contribute to high blood pressure. Vasodilation, however, is a good thing because that allows the vessels to be open and flexible so that blood can flow through smoothly. So let's notice something. When we consider high blood pressure, what is basically happening is now it has become difficult for blood to flow through your blood vessels. The pressure against the walls of your vessels will increase. This can cause high blood pressure. So. High blood pressure comes as a result of vasoconstriction. Somehow those vessels became constricted. It got thinner. It got smaller. The walls of the arteries began to press in more. The walls of the vessels began to press in more. So now the heart has to apply more pressure to get the blood through. Hence, high blood pressure. You get that? Is that what Ellen White was talking about when she said slow blood or something? It depends. I, I mean, I, gotta, you know, I need to know the whole quote. Well, what about if you have low blood pressure? We'll go into that differently. We want to focus on high blood pressure right now. And the reason why is because you're about to be broken up into groups. We're going to do an exercise.
So as we're looking at high blood pressure, that's the issue. The vessels have become constricted. Now, there are several things that can cause constriction of the vessels. Low potassium. That's the reason why that can happen. But I want to focus on some key things that are typically more availed to you and I as far as why do individuals suffer with high blood pressure, the cause. Number one, again, in our Health Power book, page 41, you find all these things out. Salt intake. Too much salt in the system causes swelling of the tissues. The swelling of the tissues because of water retention presses upon the vessels and the vessels become constricted. The heart now has to apply more pressure. So that's the connection between too much sodium and high blood pressure. People often say too much salt in the diet, you know, when they think of high blood pressure, but a lot of times we don't really understand the reasoning why. The reasoning why is because too much sodium in the system causes swelling amongst the tissues. The swelling in the tissues causes the vessels to become constricted. And as a result of that, now we have to get that excess water that caused the swelling to come out. That's why a lot of people who have high blood pressure are given water pills. Water pills. What's the, what's the medical term? Um, diuretics. diuretics. Thank you. They get diuretics. Thank you. All right. Now, so salt, definitely a culprit. Um, is, what about the good salt, like the pink Himalayan sea salt? You know, other salts are good, but remember, it's still you have to manage because sodium at the end of the day is sodium. Our body needs sodium. We're not supposed to get rid of all salt. We need sodium, but the question is proper sodium management. Some of the, some salts are different from others. So the iodine salts are not as healthy as the sea salts or the Himalayans and so on. So therefore, there's better salts than others. But at the end of the day, you can't go salt crazy just because it's a good salt. Because sodium at the end of the day is sodium, and it's going to build up. Every food you eat, as long as it's not really devitamized and demineralized, if it's, if it's a pretty decent fruit, vegetable, or what have you, they all come with a natural amount of sodium in it. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. So salt is an issue. Obesity. Definitely an issue. Obesity can definitely be a trigger. And that's why you'll find that diabetics typically have high blood pressure. Or people who have hypertension typically are diabetics. Because you'll find that they cross over one to the other. You get that? So, uh, you know, obesity. Lack of exercise. Laziness. I like that picture. It really gets the point across. Couch potato. Just sitting there. The only exercise they get is with that thumb. Well, here it is. Lack of exercise. That's another thing. That's another issue. Now, this one, pay close attention to this. Arterial plaque. That's an issue. Arterial plaque. That literally is a cause of high blood pressure. Things that we eat or put in our system that can build up plaque in the arteries. And then it narrows the walls. Heart has to apply more pressure. You get that? And then, of course, stress. Stress is definitely a factor when it comes to high blood pressure. So, so far, we looked at diabetes. We looked at some of the simple issues with those. We looked at high blood pressure and some of the symptoms with those. We can go much deeper into all of these. But I'm keeping it simple for you now because I want you, I'm going to give you a simple exercise. All right? So we understand the simple issues with diabetes. We understand the simple issues with high blood pressure. Now I want you to notice the simple issues with arthritis. There are millions upon millions of Americans who suffer with some form of arthritis. You're going to meet people like this. It would be a blessing if you could help them. So the same way you're going to meet people with diabetes, the same way you're going to meet people with high blood pressure, you're also going to meet people with arthritis, for sure, some type of arthritis. So we would do well to understand some things. Arthritis is a general term for disease or abnormal processes occurring in the joints. So there's something going on in the joints. There's a, disease of, there's a disease or abnormal process happening in their joints. And as a result of that, arthritis. That's what arthritis is. There's a, it's a general term for disease or other abnormal processes occurring in the joints. Now hold on to this because we're going to get really good with this now. So arthritis, a disease or abnormal process that is occurring in the joints, okay? What's the cause? Our joints and ligaments, like our muscles, wear with use and needs to be constantly repaired. 
a process that normally occurs during when? So when do joints need to be repaired because we use joints every day. If you're walking, if you're lifting things, moving things around, all that, you're using joints all the time. If you're running and so on, you're using joints. So as a result of that, every time we use joints, which is every day unless you're bedridden, that means that it's going to need to be repaired. The best time that the joints are repaired is during sleep. You understand that? We're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made this body in a very special way to repair itself. And the body goes through a natural repairing process when we're resting. Now, notice this. All of this, by the way, is coming from the book Health Power. So, you know, this is very powerful. Repair of any body part requires free access to oxygen, oxygen other nutrients. When circulation of the blood becomes inadequate, ligaments weaken, joint fluids decrease, and cartilage wears away. Don't lose that point. You're, gonna have, you're getting ready to break. You're almost, um, once I'm done with this, we're done. We're going to break you into groups. You have to understand that this is the connecting issue with arthritis. And you want to understand, you're going to put together a program using God's laws of health to show somebody with arthritis how to overcome it. To show somebody with diabetes how to overcome it. To show somebody with hypertension how to overcome it. So you don't want to lose these points. These are very, very important points. And you're going to find that it's going to be very helpful to you as you understand these things. What does it mean with other, other nutrients? Other nutrients. Where do we get our nutrients from? We get, our, we get our nutrients from our fruit, so therefore there's a need for nutrients. So while we need free access to oxygen, we're going to also need access, access to other nutrients, certain nutrients that our body is going to need to help rebuild the cartilage, the joints, get those fluids flowing. You get that? All right? Okay. Can we move on from this slide? All right, so move on. Move quickly because we got, we got time against us. So therefore, you want to make sure that you're watching these things because you're going to see that this becomes very, very important for you and I to know and to understand so that way we can know how to properly deal with this. Yes, my sister. Can you weaken your joints <coughs> by over-exercising? Yes. Yes, you can. Remember, we gave the example of the basketball players. There's a reason why. It, it, you know, it, it gets strange. There's a reason why professional basketball players approximately 100% approximately 100% of professional basketball players all retire in their 40s. Why is that? It is because of an overwearing and tearing of their system. Our bodies are not made to do that kind of rigorous exercise every day. So therefore, there are certain types of exercise where we can do undue damage to ourselves, certain weightlifting and things of that nature. Some of these people are trying to be Mr. Hercules, Mrs. Hercules, and do all these things. A lot of this stuff, God hasn't asked us to do these things with our bodies. It's okay to do resistance workout, but you do it in accordance to how the body is made. There's a reason why, when you look at an animal, their legs are built where there's a, the leg goes like that, and then it curves in. You get that? Their legs are made for rigorous running because running is a part of their regular day-to-day -day lifestyle. That's how they get their prey. That's how they eat. Our legs are made straight. Our legs are better built for walking rather than rigorous running all the time. There's a reason why our physical structure is made the way it's made. You get that? So that's why you've got to keep in mind of these things. So we're, our bodies are not made to overexert itself. It's not that we can't run. God certainly made our bodies to run. But at the same time, we have to properly manage it and not try to run in the same nature that animals run where their body physical bone structure is made for it as a part of their lifestyle, where it's not made for us. That's why Ellen White says walking is the best exercise for us, not jogging, not trotting. Not doing relay races and running marathons and all those things. You can do those as exceptions, but the chief exercise for us is walking because that our body can handle very, very well. Yes? Um, I was just going to mention that the, a lot of the marathon runners, they develop an enlarged heart because they run, and that's what they do, they're marathon runners, so they end up developing enlarged hearts because it's a muscle. That's right. Very good. Appreciate that point. Talking about a lot of the marathon runners that many a times they develop yeah, my sister's talking about the marathon runners that they develop uh, an enlarged heart over a period of time because, again, over-exercising those muscles. So, you know, we, we, we can't let the world dictate to us. There's a lot of things the world calls health that is not true health in the long run. 
And that's why you, I'm telling you, if, if we could stick to what inspiration tells us, oh man, I tell you, we're so blessed. So let's go ahead. Osteoarthritis. This is a form of arthritis. Osteoarthritis. You're going to run into people with this. Osteoarthritis. It usually occurs when a joint's what? When a joint's blood supply becomes inadequate for its needed function. Joints begin to break down when the arteries supplying them become narrowed or obstructed. Hold on to that because you're going to be dealing with individuals who suffer with osteoarthritis. So you need to know how to help them. Osteoarthritis occurs when the joint's blood supply becomes inadequate, not getting enough blood. Not getting enough blood. Because remember, the purpose of blood is to repair waste. It, it is to repair the body, remove waste, strengthen the system, carry nutrients. All of that is connected with blood. So this becomes very important, all right? Osteoarthritis. It's recommended. I, I, I highly recommend. When God made Adam and Eve, my sister asked the question, if you're, even, if you're having a vegan diet or vegetarian diet, um, you know, should you go ahead and still get like your checkups and things, especially even for things like, you said arthritis or diabetes? Diabetes. Diabetes. You know, it would seem natural that we wouldn't have it if you have that kind of diet, right? But I know a lot of people, we have different concepts of a vegetarian diet. Uh, you know, and as a result of that, sometimes we still need reforms, even though we don't eat meat. We can still eat too much of certain things. Like as an example, mushrooms. Uh, if you eat mushrooms, it is a fact that mushrooms can bring about cholesterol, bad cholesterol in your system, mushrooms. So if a person says, well, I like to have mushroom this, mushroom that, mushroom, 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 then it's possible that even though you're not eating animal products, you can still eat something that can increase your cholesterol. And that can affect, of course, your arteries, it can affect your heart, and the list goes on. So there's things that we can do, even though we have a quote-unquote vegetarian diet, that still is not the best health practices, generally speaking. So the same way God made Adam and Eve to be stewards over the earth, we are to be stewards over our bodies. And God wants us to take care. And we don't have to guess when God gives us an opportunity to know. If you and I have the ability to get a checkup once per year, to just say, find out what's going on in your system, make sure everything's all right. There are deadly taints, Great Controversy, page 589 says. There are deadly taints that Satan has put in the air. So even though we're healthy and so on and so forth, Satan is putting deadly taints in the air that just by the breathing in of it, I could ingest something in my system that could cause a problem if I don't catch it early enough. So for several reasons, it's a blessing to get that annual checkup and just to make sure all is well inside of this body temple. So I highly encourage that. If the sanctuary was cleansed once a year, you should do a whole body cleanse at least once a year. You get that? So, I mean, you learn these practical lessons from the Bible. Yes. Uh, two point one to her question is carbs. You got to be careful not to get too much carbs. Unutilized carbs then is stored as fat, so that'll go into the sugar. Um, one. And then the second point I wanted to bring out with diabetes is that it can take many years before diabetes shows up, and it's a silent um, epidemic. So it is good. It would behoove everyone to get checked once a year because by the time the symptoms come up. It has been years of damage that's been done, and then it shows up and demonstrates in symptoms. Absolutely. Point well taken. Yes, Sister Rayner. What are some deadly miasma or taints, as you term it, that Satan's putting in Well, as an example, when I think about pericarditis, you know, um, pericarditis is something where it's a bacteria where you can just be around someone else and as a result of someone uh, sneezing or whatever the case may be, that that's something that I can unfortunately take in. And the next thing you know, it can affect me. Because when the doctor asked me, have you had a cold recently? Have you had this? Have you had that? My answer was, no, no, no. I haven't even had the sniffles. And then he said, well, you might have been in an environment where, some, where this bacteria was, and you probably ingested it somehow, maybe through touching, touching the sensitive tissues. Maybe it was something in the air that you breathe in via germs. So 
we, there are several examples. There are some examples that we can find of things that can just flow throughout our atmosphere that unfortunately we can end up taking in our system and it can have an adverse effect on us. The same way there's like radiation exposure or certain other things, so it is that we can probably run into certain challenges. Maybe we'll look up some more specific ones before the class is over. Yeah, I mean, if it fits all the time, you know, we're going to have to start ascertaining some causes, and I'm going to let you all figure it out when you do your rheumatoid arthritis, when you do your arthritis, generally. This is rheumatoid. Rheumatoid arthritis, it results from inflammation of the joints. So the joints are inflamed. Inflammation of the joints with redness, swelling, pain, and fever, rather from injury or wear and tear. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease related to asthma, hay fever, eczema, and other diseases that have an allergic component. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little different from osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, lack of blood supply. Rheumatoid arthritis, swelling amidst the joints. Swelling amidst the joints. Inflammation. 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 That's rheumatoid. We're probably going to look at one or two more types of arthritis. Yes, we're going to look at a very popular form of arthritis. And then uh, we'll look at one more, and then I'm going to break you all into your groups. Look at a very popular form of arthritis. And that's what I'm asking you to do. You, I mean, you can write it down word for word if you'd like, but the key thing that you want to get, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation of the joints. Inflammation of the joints. That, that's the key thing you want to get. Again, I encourage you, add to your library the book Health Power. It's a very good book for, for these type of things right here. It, it's, a, it's such a practical book that just about anybody can read, even though we're ignorant, and we can go ahead and read it and leave after reading that book and feel like we're a medical professional. So, <laughs> you know, so I mean, no, they, they did a good job with that book. I, I do like that book very much. I think there's several things in there that are of great value to us who are medical missionaries. It's saying that it's relating to those um, that have... It's, it's an autoimmune disease which is related to other types of diseases like asthma, hay fever, eczema, and other diseases that have allergic components. So something you do that you're allergic to can help you get that? No, 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 no. The, what it's doing is it's just showing that this is related to other types of diseases that have an allergic component to it, things that we, we use, usually have an allergic reaction to, or things of that nature. But it's not to say that asthma and arthritis are totally going hand in hand. All right, can we move? Yes. Back aches. Back aches are generally known as, you know, a type of arthritis. Back aches. Over 5 million Americans have them. All sorts of back aches. I even get back aches sometimes. Uh, one of the reasons why is I did martial arts very vigorously. So as a result of that, you get hit. And you get hit sometimes, you get hit really hard. You know, I remember my first time going from beginner's class to advanced class, and uh, one of my instructors, Mr. Nodrin, he told me very clearly, he says, look, you're going to get hit, and it's going to hurt. And he was not lying. I mean, I took some blows. And, you know, and, um, you know martial arts is so incredibly vicious. You know, it can be anyhow. But nevertheless, you know, did martial arts for several years. I, I determined to be a master at it. And, and, you know, I was fixed on it. It was only because of dancing, because I was also a dancer, that I decided to let dancing be the flow of my career. I was determined to be the next Bruce Leroy. I was like, that's it. I'm going to learn how to do this thing. I'm gonna, I mean, I, seriously, I determined to be a master at martial arts. Because whatever I, I do, I fix my mind to do it with excellence. So therefore, you know, I really wanted to become a great martial artist. So you practice, and sometimes you do vigorous things. You do very strange things. Uh, you get up to certain levels, then there's meditation. There's a lot of things involved that get very much into the spiritual world, the chi. You know, and you start to focus on these things, the inner energies. And this is where you start going into certain realms that now I can see the spiritualistic connection to martial arts. It's very much a bait and switch, kind of like... Um, what's those guys called? The, 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 the Masons. You know, the Masons in the beginning, they look like... Really nice people. You know, Masons just look like good guys who are just committing, doing great things for society and so on. But when you get higher up in Freemasonry, that's when you discover, oh, this is where it's leading to. And those are some of the points. That's why, again, I go back to this. And I don't want to harbor on it. But when we get into the false forms of medical missionary work, understand there's always an end result to these things. 
They don't just want to leave it there at just the reflexology or the iridology. There's philosophies always connected to it that are also introduced as well. And then those philosophies begin to take us to a different level. So at first it's going to come very innocent because Satan always comes as an angel of light. But then eventually the darkness becomes revealed. So it is that in martial arts, you know, that's how I develop these backaches. You know, you get in, you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to learn how to defend myself. But you start learning more, you see more, there's meditations, there's certain things involved. We start seeing more of the spiritualistic nature. But aside from that, you can go through some serious damages. And in my case, I definitely got backaches, you know, from it because I took a lot of shots in the back. So people suffer with backaches for all sorts of reasons, lifting weights wrong. Sometimes people who just don't know how to pick up a package. I always tell people, and, and please remember this, don't pick up packages with your back. Don't pick things up like this. You're relying on this muscle to do that. When you pick up a package, you bend down with your legs, and you pick up, and you let the legs lift you up. You'll be amazed at how much of a difference that is. I cannot tell you how many people have done, I mean, just tremendous damage to their backs just because they constantly pick things up, and they're relying on the back muscle. And our, our bodies are not made to do that. Suspension. You are supposed to suspend weight from your shoulders and not from your hips. This is why Ellen White used to speak very uh, strongly against those women who would wear hoop dresses. And some of these dresses, she said, weighed up to 15 pounds. And they would wear those dresses and they would wear it and suspend that weight from their hips. You get some people who go to extremes now. Now they wear suspenders all the time. Guys. But that's, that's not necessary. The key thing is, is that when you wear a belt, you don't restrict that belt so tight that it begins to obstruct circulation. What you want to do is when you wear your belt, you just want to be able to wear it where it's tight enough to hold everything up to a proper place. But you should be able to lift your arms up where your shirt can come out easily from it. And therefore, you know it's not too tight. When you take your uh, uh, pants off, you shouldn't be able to see a belt mark wrapping around your waist. That means you're putting it on too tight. And you will obstruct circulation. And always remember, perfect circulation equals perfect health. So you don't want to do anything in your system. When the women used to wear the corsets and they would literally squeeze in their organs just to have an hourglass shape. Talk about vanity. You know, so these are all the things you want to keep in mind. And it debilitates us. But I tell you, there are several practices that people do where they suffer with backaches. It's a form of arthritis. All right? Then, of course, there's gouty arthritis. That's our last one we'll look at. Gouty, gouty arthritis. It accounts for approximately 5% of all cases of arthritis, but it is existent. Gouty arthritis is one of the most painful rheumatic diseases. Gouty arthritis is, it usually strikes a single joint, most commonly the big toe. Gouty arthritis. Um, and it says about 75% of people are affected at least once. However, it can also affect the foot, ankles, knees, wrists, elbows, and fingers. Gouty arthritis. So these are, these are different types of arthritis that you, you want to be aware of. And then we're going to look at something as it relates to a review on the arthritis. And then we're going to break you up into groups because our time is drastically escaping us. We have a lot to cover today. We're going to be learning about how to conduct evangelistic cooking schools. So we're going to talk about that today. Then, of course, we're going to have a cooking demonstration. Then after that, we're going to be talking, we're going to take our breaks, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about dress reform. We're going to understand dress both from health and spirituality. Then we're also going to talk about how to enter into the uh, uh, first day churches and to share health reform with them. How do we do that? We're going to have some documents we're going to be putting in your hands today. You have several documents that we printed out for all of you. So we're going to make sure we have those documents for you as well. So we have a lot to cover today. By the grace of God, we'll get it done. All right, so this is gouty arthritis. Can we move on? Okay. Now, we're going to review what items causes these various forms of arthritis. Look at this now. Careful, because you're getting ready to go into your meeting. Poor circulation, which can come as a result of. Ready? Poor circulation that can come as a result of, number one, lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. Number two, lack of exercise. Lack of exercise. Number three, lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen. Number four, poor nutrition. Poor nutrition. 
You have all that? All right. Now, what we want to do is we want to break everybody up into groups. You want your foods encyclopedias. You want your nature's healing way. Who does not have a nature's healing way that, uh, you know, you have one, but you didn't bring it with you today? Is there anybody? Okay, one, two, three. The nature's healing way. Who does not have their nature's healing way with them today? Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? Seven? Yeah, the nature's healing way. Seven. Hey, where's those books at? Okay. Okay, so you, you don't have yours either? All right, ladies and gentlemen, because you already have these books, these are loners. So give them back when you're done, please. Yeah? Okay, what we're going to do is we are going to break. We're going to break into groups. I'm going to give you 25 minutes. What I'm going to do is assign each group one of these diseases. And what your group is going to do is you're going to take what you've learned as it relates to God's blessed laws of health. And you're going to talk to me on how you can help somebody with arthritis, with diabetes, with high blood pressure, on how, by the grace of God, they can bid that disease farewell. So I want you to put your minds together, be prayerful about it, take the information you've learned, because I promise you, you have no idea how much of a blessing you can be to people once you know how to take this information and you know how to literally put together a solution for them on how they can overcome by the grace of God. All right? We're going to break up into groups of three. Now, the way we're going to do this... All right. Okay. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to ask you to move one chair over. Right here. What we're going to do is my arm is going to go from my brother right here, right in between Sister Myers and her son, back. You are group one. So here, two, three, four, Sister Myers, Brother Myers, Little Myers, my sister in the back, my brother in the back, you all make group one. I'm going to ask you, please congregate, come together immediately. Now, group two. Group two is going to be Yep. Group two is going to be one, two, three, four. Oldest son, Myers, five. Brother Chin Lee, six. Who's sitting there? Hassan is sitting there. And Brother Hassan, seven. So you make group two. Okay? So you get that? One, two, three, four. Oldest Myers, my dear sister, Brother Chin Lee, Brother Hassan, group two. Everyone else, group three. Everyone else, group three. From Sister Irene to the left, group three. Please break. Break into groups. We are going to start calculating 25 minutes. Excellent. It is exactly, what time? Is that 10 o'clock? Good. 10 o'clock, 10.25, folks. 10.25, we're coming back. You can meet wherever you like. Group one, hear me good. Hold on before you go. Group one, diabetes. Group two, arthritis. Group three, hypertension. You got it? Find a representative. Have a seven-minute maximum presentation on how they can overcome. Let's break.